I appreciate that. All right. Let's give Brother Ruckman a good Michigan welcome. Boo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's wonderful to be appreciated. <laughs> All right. Take a Bible tonight. We'll turn to two places. Let's turn to take a Bible tonight. We'll turn to uh, Revelation chapter 20. Made in America. <laughs> Revelation chapter 20 and Acts chapter 17. Revelation chapter 20 and Acts chapter 17. I'm playing the hockey nine rollerblades in Idaho every year, and then I'm playing on foot at home, and I'm playing ice up here, and I've got a meeting with a guy in South Dakota in February. <laughs> so, uh, going to get it worked out, schedule worked out after a while, I guess, so we can stand it all year round. I'm really going to have to retire, I think, in about a year. I'm the only goalie still playing with glaucoma and cataracts. <laughs> well, I get a blessing and enjoy it. And uh, brother, notice I come up here, some of brother, uh, brother Bartlett's uh, folks don't care too much for my ministry, I guess. An awful lot of maps, you know, we just might know what the problem is. So. And I've been already figured out, uh, God just goes right on bless me no matter what you think. Amen. Amen. Tell me what you think. Amen. You think anything you want to think. It means nothing to me one way or another. Uh, this last year I've been to Korea preaching on the street. I've been to the Philippines. And I've been to Hawaii preaching. And I've been to about two federal penitentiaries, a couple of state penitentiaries, and a couple of juvenile Lincoln homes. I've seen about 50 or 60 grown men saved in one of them. About 25, another one, about... So oh, 27 young men between 15 and 18, another one. And the Lord goes out and bless me no matter what they think. And they talk and they talk and they talk and they talk. It doesn't do them any good. It's just wasting the time. Just nothing to them. My bills are paid. None of them drink. None of them smoke. All of them believe the Bible. Got a good wife. Fixed me two hot meals a day. Take care of my kid and take care of me. I had the best care of taking me here the last three years I've ever had in my life. I'm enjoying life. I, I tell you, the last three years, the last three years have been the best three years of my life. And you won't hear many folks over 70 say that. I mean, three score and ten, all I suppose you have, man. What I've had since three score and ten been the best. And I, I, I voted this year. I voted Republican right across the board, you know. <laughs> I know who was running. I just know I had enough of this mess, you know. So I just voted across. <laughs> you know, in spite of the news media slick, you know now what we think. The truth of the matter is the nation thinks you stink. <laughs> That's the truth of it. That's the truth of it. And uh, I'm glad they did what they did. I wish they'd done more than they did. I think the first thing you ought to do is impeach him and then arrest Gianna Reno and try her for murder. I think that's the best, best thing to do. And that'd be conservative. That'd be conservative. I think such a hellish, damnable, godless, depraved, stinking, juvenile, psychotic mess in all my life. And what a thing, man. Call out a man, gonna attack Haiti, and he wouldn't go in the draft himself. What a guy. Okay, boys, let's land on the beach, but count me out, you know. Kind of <laughs> you know, we had a word for kind of fellow like that when I was a boy. We called him a punk. We figured the reason Chelsea is so ugly is because Janet Reno is her father. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my, my generation was much clearer than yours, you know. We, we weren't obscure about anything. All right, now, if you've got a Bible there, turn to Revelation chapter 20 and take a verse 11, and then... On the other hand, get Acts chapter 17, and Acts chapter 17 to start there about verse, uh, oh, about verse uh, 31, I think it is long in there. Acts chapter 17, verse 31. Oh, uh, I'm right, I just finished a book called Black is Beautiful here a couple of months ago. I had more trouble writing that book than any book I ever, ever wrote for. Uh, it was only 300 pages. And I had more trouble writing that book than I did writing 800 pages in church history. And that book is about black power and black Muslims and the black death and the black knights and the black rose and the black fun and the black helicopters and the black uniforms and the black holes and the black mail and the black list and the so forth and so on. You have such a thing in all your life. I've been doing about 15 years of research on UFOs and Groom Lake and Area 51 and a bunch of stuff. And I'm telling you, that book is a hair razor boy. I mean, writing that book sometime, whole sheets of paper disappear for a week. 
And sometimes a paper disappeared, I'd find it, get it back. Sometimes it disappeared and I wouldn't find it back. I had a place in there where I could have sworn I wrote down something, checked back, the thing is missing. I had a place in there where I didn't write a thing down, wrote back, and the thing was sitting there. The wildest thing you ever seen in your life. And I don't, I don't know what trouble I'm going to have getting that thing printed. If I have much trouble getting that thing printed as I did writing it, it's going to take about uh, six months to get that thing in the market. But that thing is something else. That thing deals with uh, Inca and Maya and Aztec and Greek and Roman and Chinese mythology, and it's related to uh, light bending rays, genetics, age, mind control, thought control, spaceships, laser beams, and the rest of it. It'll, it'll get up and climb that thing. All right, now you got the book there. Turn to Revelation chapter 20 and start there about verse 11. And uh, maybe we better read the one in Acts first, Acts 17, 31, and then go to Revelation. So let's go to Acts 17, where it says, God has appointed a day in which he's going to judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. And he's given all men assurance everywhere in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now that's uh, Paul talking about the resurrection. That's his favorite subject, the resurrection. He talks about it all the time. And he said that God has appointed a day uh, they hasn't come yet, but it's appointed, it's set, in which going to judge the world in righteousness by that man whom the hath ordained. God's ordained a judge. God's ordained a day for you in court, and a judge, and set up the judge. And then he says uh, he's ordained a day, and he's uh, set up a judge, ordained uh, a man to judge the world in righteousness. So when God's going to judge the world, he's going to judge the world by a man. He ain't going to judge him just by God. That wouldn't count. What would God know about you? God doesn't get tired. You get tired. God can't be tempted to sin. You can be. God doesn't get, get thirsty. You get thirsty. God doesn't die. He doesn't kick the bucket. You kick the bucket. So God got this thing worked it out where he gets a man to judge you so there can't be any complaints. And then he picks the man and confirms what man it is. He has given all men assurance. That is, you know who the judge is. Now, if you don't know who the judge is, uh, then you haven't paid attention to what God showed. He's given all men assurance in that God hath raised him from the dead. Now, that's proof the judge is going to be one man, not another man. Uh, the other people came up from the dead all died again. Lazarus came up from the dead and died again. Jonah came up from the dead and died again. The widow of Nain's son came up from the dead and died again. Eulus came up from the dead and died again. Dorcas came up from the dead and died again, but not this one. This one comes up the dead, he doesn't ever die again. Amen. And that's proof that he's going to be the judge. Now, that ought to disturb a fellow. Because somebody thinks Muhammad is going to judge him. Muhammad couldn't keep me awake. <laughs> I know all about Muhammad. I mean, when he was, you know, married a 13-year-old girl, and she bought a dollars of the palace, and he had epileptic fits, and foam to the mouth, and slobbered like a camel. Right before he died, he asked God to kill all the Christians and the Jews. I mean, what a fool. What a blank fool. You tell out to Muhammad, and he has a fit. You say, what's the matter? He got some kind of a spirit in him, peculiar spirit in him. That's his problem. This problem. Muhammad, one of the biggest blanks that ever lived. Wa shadu Rasulullah shahari al Muhammad mektum bisma Allah. There's one God, and he's Allah. Muhammad is prophet. Come, come on, come on, man. Muhammad couldn't even tell you the year he was going to die. Jesus Christ said, I got three more days, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be delivered to the Gentiles, I'm going to be whipped, I'm going to be spit on, they're going to scourge me, they're going to nail me, and I'm coming up from the dead. Just like that, boy. Hey, you want a prophet, there's a prophet. I mean, Muhammad. Muhammad is prophet. Tut, tut, tut. <laughs> I mean, what did he ever prophesy? I read the Koran. I read the Koran through about three times. I don't recall anything in that whole book that, uh, where, where prophecy isn't taken out of the Old Testament. Old Testament prophesy was 48 things about a man before he's born. They all come to pass, and uh, 400 years after they prophesied, why, Muhammad, he couldn't handle stuff like that. And that isn't all he did. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody said, you don't have to worry about Muhammad judging you. He's just, he's just as dead as your great-grandfather is. You don't have to worry about Buddha judging. He's down there rotten. They, they show his bones over there in India every now and then. They got Muhammad's death place. They got where he's buried. They make pilgrimages there. You make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to find out where Jesus Christ was buried. You know what happens when you get there? You find two angels sitting there saying, he's not here, he's risen. Amen. Now, there's a difference. Now, right now, they're trying to get all the, 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 the world's religion together. They all have something in common, you know. They all have something in common. Uh, 
Well, they all have something in common, all religions, I guess you might say that. But you say, well, there's nothing unique about biblical Christianity because there's things unique to these other religions too. No, there is something very unique about uh, American Christian or biblical Christianity. You know what's unique about it? It's a songbook. The others don't have any songbooks about the saviors. People sing when they get happy. That's what birds do. They sing when they get happy. People sing when they get happy. You don't believe it? Just pick up that rock and roll stuff down there. See if they aren't all just, you know, just blowing their guts all the time, trying to express themselves. Now, you've got a song book up here. It's got 500 songs in it about one man. Amen. Got any songs about Buddha? We've heard the joyful sound, Buddha save, Buddha save. He couldn't save a dead cat, man. You never saw a sign out there saying Muhammad saves. Do you know why you don't? Because he couldn't save anybody. That's why you don't. I mean, who ever heard of a bunch of songs praising Buddha or praising Muhammad? I was talking to Muhammad at one time, a Muslim one time. I, I deal with them once in a while. They're around. They're in a military bases. Then black helicopters flying over your head have Muslims in them and atheists and Catholics. The devil has a religious controversy for this country. And what he wants is some BATF teams and DAA teams and SWAT teams to come into your home and take what you got, see what you got, and shut you down. And those aren't Christians in them helicopters. And those aren't people believe in democracy in those helicopters. And those people in those helicopters are Roman Catholics, that's idolaters that messed up Europe, or else they're Muslim that messed up India, and messed up Africa, and messed up a lot of Arabia, or else they're atheists or communists that messed up Russia. And so a bunch of people think, well, oh, this patriotic stuff, this patriotic stuff. You don't have to be a patriot to understand what I just said. All the benefits you got right now, you got from having that Bible in this country and having it preached. You want to trade that in for that slop over there? Why don't you go there and live for a while, if you like it so well. You folks don't think that Muslimism and Hinduism and Buddhism great stuff? Go over there a while. Live in India for a while. You ladies. You know, hollering, women abuse, wife abuse, you know, go over there and live and see how it works out over there. All this stuff in America about the women equality, equality women, taking care of the woman, put the woman here, put the woman there. Go over to India and see how that works out. Go to Japan, that's a good place. That's a good place, Japan. See what they think about that. What you get, you get from that book, and you may not believe that book, but all the benefits you get still come from that book. They're not the same. My Savior is alive. Their Savior is dead. I said that Muslim. I said, what did your prophet ever do for you? He said, he taught me the truth. I said, I didn't ask you that. I said, what did he ever do for you? He said, well, he taught me the right way. I said, I didn't ask you that. I said, what did he ever do for you? He said, what do you mean? I said, what did he ever do for you personally as an individual? And he said, well, what did yours ever do for you? I said, he died for me. Don't tell me they're the same. Buddha didn't die for anybody. He didn't care about enough to die for him. Muhammad didn't care about enough to die for him. Male say tongue, male say, male, a male, a uh, uh, male, uh, uh, male, uh, male say, he, they didn't love anybody enough to die for him. Zoros didn't love anybody enough to die for them. I know somebody loves you enough to die for you, and God made him the judge. Now, that ought to worry a fella. If, if I was going to go up and face Buddha, I'd just say, well, you lazy bum, sitting under a bow tree, if a man, man, man doesn't work, he's not to eat. Or you ought to starve to death, you good-for-nothing bum. <laughs> you think Muhammad would point a finger at me? I could throw as many rocks at him he could throw at me. Why, well, sure, man. I'd say, well, you don't pray for God to kill all the Jews and Christians. The Jews are God's chosen people. God put a curse on you like a bullet on Balaam, boy. But listen, if Jesus Christ showed up, I wouldn't have nothing to say. You say, why? They didn't in his day. He said, which of you convinces me of sin? And nobody opened the yap. And if you got up there right now before him, what would you say? You couldn't say nothing. Now, it's easy to talk big down here. See, I know how it is down here. I mean, it's easy to be the big boy down here, but wait till you get up there. Wait till you see that one that he said in the day, God's going to judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. The right, God's righteousness is Jesus Christ. And when God wants to have a righteous man, he got his man picked out, and he's going to judge you. Just think about this. How would you like to be judged by a man who never had to clear his throat and repeat himself? How would you like to be judged by a man who never had to confess a sin to anybody or confess a mistake? 
That's what it's going to be. God's standard is perfect, and the perfect standard is Jesus Christ. How do you know? He wouldn't stay down. He came up. The proof's in the pudding. The rest of us stay down. That's proof we're not the right thing. Now, it's easy to talk big down here. I know how they are back there in the locker room and the shower room, you know, talking about scoring and this and that, you know, and, and telling the dirty jokes and stuff. It's, it's easy to talk big down here. But boy, wait till you get up there. Hey, Judas. Hey, Judas. See him? You sold him out for 30 pieces of silver, Judas. Hey, you going to go up and kiss him again, Judas, like you did in the Garden of Gethsemane? Hey, Judas. Hey, boy, what's the matter? Kind of green around the gills, aren't you, buddy? <laughs> you know what the trouble is? He's nervous of clam at low tide. Not, and not this judgment's gonna, not going to run up and kiss him. No way. Caiaphas, you slapped him down there in the judgment hall. You're going to spit on him, slap on him, slap him again, Caiaphas? You know what Caiaphas is doing? He's running, crying, rocks, falling us mountains, cover us in the face, the lamb for the day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? That's the business. Ought to put fear in the fellow. Folks say, well, Ruckman, you can't scare me. No, probably can't scare some of you. are too stupid. You're like Roosevelt. I guess that blockhead, if he had a brain in his head, nobody ever found it. That fellow got up one time and he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. What an irresponsible fool. <laughs> Imagine a guy saying, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. How about going through a red light in the highway? <laughs> <laughs> How about the mother of 88 pointing at you right in your face? How about age, you know? You know, The only thing we have to fear is fear. What an irresponsible fool. If somebody collected what our presidents have said through the years, if a visitor from outer space came down and read it, he'd think this whole place was a lunatic asylum. <laughs> uh, you imagine a fellow from outer space coming down and reading Harry S. Truman, 1950, saying, the foundation of the United Nations will bring in the greatest era of peace the world has ever known. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> What a thing to say, man. You know how many wars have been fought since 1945? I wrote them down. 79 of them. 79. One every 230 days. 79 cotton picking wars. And the commander in chief. The greatest era of peace the world is. They're, they're loonies. They're loonies. They're loonies. <laughs> the more they talk, the loonier they get. Now you take that thing right there. Fellas talk big down here, you know. Fella gives you a first. Shot of liquor, you know, back here in the locker room behind the barn someplace in the garage when mom and daddy can't see it. I bet you don't offer him one. Uh, Jesus, you want to swig of this? Uh, I bet you won't. Hey, Jesus, I've seen these, these uh, pictures here. I cut out a Playboy. Uh, uh, yeah. Ever hear the one about the fellow traveling down the road? Came to the farmhouse at night and traveling to Salem and his. No, you won't. You won't pull them in him, buddy. Down here, big boy, big boy down, big boy, big man, tough. You wait till you hit that one. Listen, that day they're going to be strong men cry like babies and iron men scream like women, boy. Weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. You wait till that time comes. You say, Ruck, I'm just trying to scare us. I sure am. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. Folks, I don't believe in the scaring folks. You're lying. You're lying like a dog. You're a liar. You're a liar. You. You're just lying like a map. You folks up here, you got fire insurance, life insurance, medical insurance, collision insurance, liability, old age, unemployment. You got every cut and picking thing in the world. You know. You're afraid you go broke. You're afraid you wind up the poor house. You're afraid you get cancer. You're afraid there's something go wrong with the house. You're afraid you have an accident and can't pay for it. Don't tell me you don't believe in fear. That's how they sell you insurance policies. I saw a big sign out there on the highway for an insurance company and it said, get scared and stay scared. <laughs> you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to sell you something. And you buy it. Uh, I haven't been around too long, but I, I've seen a few things in my day, you know. If I live as long as I have, I'm, this is my 40, I've been the minister now 46 years. That's nearly half a century. And some of these guys have been long enough. Some of them have been in 50 years and 55. But 46 is enough time to get broke in. <laughs> And let me tell you something, I've learned some things. And I'll tell you, boys and girls, wisdom lies in just one thing. It's knowing when to be afraid and when not to be afraid. And that's all there is to wisdom. If you're afraid of something you shouldn't be afraid of, you're not wise. 
And if you're not afraid of something you should be afraid of, you're not wise. Wisdom is knowing when to be scared and when not to be scared. Christ said, fear him, they will destroy both body and soul in hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. And some of you don't. People say, they say, well, I just don't believe in the same folks of fear. You don't? You ever sing Amazing Grace? How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was blind, but now I'm found as blind, and by now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to what, folks? And grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. That's the business. You say, I don't believe in fear. Sure you believe in fear. Fear is a good, healthy emotion. Oh, Ruckman, if you ever win me, you'll have to win by love. You're not going to win me by fear, you know. Like a guy sitting out here on the railroad track over in Germany, where they still run about 120 on the railroad track, and you stand there and the red light's warning, and to get off, and I come up and yell, you fools coming down the track, get off the track, get off the track. You're going to get mashed, you're going to get squashed. You sit there and say, don't threaten me, you can't win me by fear. <laughs> well, brother, pick you up in a vacuum cleaner, what's going to happen? <laughs> When I was a boy, we used to have a song that said, A peanut man sat on the track, his heart was in a flutter, around the corner came a train, toot toot peanut butter. <laughs> and I believe that. I believe that. That's one of the fundamentals of the faith. All right, now here's, here's a judgment, and God has already assigned the, the, the judge's role, and God's already told you who he's going to be. And he says he's given all men, I guess that's everybody here, all men assurance everywhere, in that he hath raised him from the dead. The surest proof that just going to be Jesus Christ is the fact that he came up from the dead and the rest of them didn't. It's just that simple. And I'm going to bring a fellow, I tell him I'm going to, I'm going to bring a sinner to the judgment here and see how he made out. We'll take a sinner here and bring him in. I saw a, I saw a movie advertisement one time for a movie it, it, and for, to sell the movie they put a little, little line in there and said, filmed on location inside a woman's soul. You know, all that stuff, you know. I thought to myself, man, you never seen a soul bought out and stripped naked. But I'll show you one. I'll let you see something filmed inside a soul. I'll bring you a soul here and let you show how show how it made out. And you know, Hollywood never could get it right. They never could get it right. You can't they can't tell the truth. I'll be the only honest Hollywood title I ever saw I saw on the on the uh, arcade of a, well, one of those uh, drive-in theaters years ago, and the name of the movie was any, Everything But the Truth. <laughs> that was the name of the movie. <laughs> I said, there's an honest title now, brother. I mean, they never do get it right. Well, when they had the Exodus, they had Pharaoh come back to his palace after it was over. Hey, man, he didn't come back. He drowned like a rat. They never could get it right. They never could get it right. They had a movie one time about a, about a bad woman, and they said, the damn don't cry. Yes, they do. There's weeping and wedding and gnash of teeth. I had a movie one time about a chronic alcoholic, a woman chronic alcoholic. And the name of that uh, movie was I'll Cry Tomorrow, was the name of that movie. That was years and years ago. I don't even know who was acting in the thing. But the name of the thing was I'll Cry Tomorrow. And I saw that title and I said to myself, well, that's a lie. That's a lie. I know women who are chronic alcoholics, and they don't cry tomorrow. They cry the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. You say, like who? Like my mother. Don't tell me about it. I'll tell you about it. I learned how to drink and smoke and play five-card draw and seven-card stud watching my mother in the living room. They don't cry tomorrow. They cry the next day and 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 the next day. There's no peace to the wicked, saith my God. Oh, I'm going to bring a soul in here and we're going to see how he made out. And, uh... He says it is appointed men once to die, but after this the judgment. And he said, God shall bring thee into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. He says in another place, there's nothing hid that shall not be uncovered, nothing done in a secret that shall not be known. He says in another place, in the day that God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now, if you're dealing with a God that knows you're down sitting and you're uprising, understand you're thought afar of off. And David said, O Lord, there's not a word in my tongue, but thou dost not know it altogether. If you're dealing with a God like that, how would you make out a judgment like that? I was talking to a real self-righteous fellow the day, the Kraut down there in uh, Pensacola. He's a Volkswagen mechanic, and a good one. His name is Peterson. I've got three Krauts I've been working on from somewhere to five to 15 years. I never met much of the most self-righteous people in all my life. 
you have the hardest time convincing them that they just don't believe they're ungodly. They just don't believe it. And I've worked on that guy. I've worked on him. Some of our fellows, Brother Hughes and Brother Lovello in the church have worked on him. I've hit him twice. They've hit him about six times. And this last time I went by to see him, I said, I'm tired of arguing this guy. I'm just going to put it to him. And I got him out in the front yard. And I said, you been in a Baptist church yet since you've been here? He said, no. I said, how long have you been in America? He said, 15 years. I said, aren't you worried? Somebody think you're kind of stupid. <laughs> he said, wait a minute. You've been, you been in America 15 years and never been in a Baptist church? What an opportunity. I said, over in Europe, we got more Baptist churches in Pensacola than you got in Germany and France. You've ever 15 years knowing what the inside of a Baptist church looks like. He said, well, it's, I don't like to go there because they always try to make you feel bad. <laughs> I said, well, you ought to feel bad. It's good for you. You're bad. Oh, no, I'm not a bad man, Dr. Ruckman. I'm not a bad. I said, yes, you are all sin comes from the glory of God. No, I'm a good man. I'm a good man. So I, he said, I, I, don't, I resent that being told I'm a bad man. I resent, I resent God telling me that. And I said, well, I'm a bad man. That, that, he wasn't ready for that one, you know. And he said, oh, no, no, you're not a bad man. Just don't tell me. I know myself better than you, you know me. What are you trying to give me here? I said, buddy, if I had to give account for the thing I've thought in the last 48 hours, I'd go to hell like a bullet. And, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, you wouldn't do that. Oh, I, yes, don't give me that stuff, man. Don't give me that stuff. Now, if you're honest, if you're honest, and <laughs> what a quality that is these days. <laughs> if you're honest, you know you couldn't face a judgment where everything you thought in the last 48 hours could come out on a screen. And if you don't believe that, it's just because you're dishonest or you're just stupid. I don't know which, maybe both. But you're going to face a judgment like that, it's going to come out. Uh, he said, the judgment was set and the books were opened. And I saw the dead, the small and great. Now we can go to Revelation. Revelation chapter 20, verse uh, 11. Revelation 20, verse 11. I saw a great white throne, and him had sat on it, but before whose face the heaven and earth fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, the small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things written in the books, that man according to his works. And the sea of death and hell delivered the dead which were in them, and the sea delivered the dead which were in it. They would judge every man according to his works. And whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now that's the judgment. Now that's the final judgment. We call that the final judgment of the unsaved dead. There are many judgments in the Bible, like there's the judgment of the nation when Christ comes back. There's the judgment of the Jew in the tribulation. There's the judgment seat of Christ for the Christian. There's the judgment of our sins at Calvary. There's the self-judgment of the believer in this dispensation. But this is the last one. This is the last one. When they talk about a general resurrection, a general judgment, this is what they're talking about. And every major religion in the world believes that someday, sometime, someplace, somewhere, you'll give a chav coming to you. The Mohammedans believe that. And the Jews believe that. And the Catholics believe that, and the Greek Orthodox believe that. Buddhist believes it in a way. He believes if you don't behave yourself, you'll have to come back as a lower form of life. You see, man's conscience is so fixed that you can't avoid retribution. And something in you tells you that someday, sometime, someplace, there's got to be equalizing. There's got to be a payment. There's got to be, if there's any God up there, then the thing has got to get balanced finally. Or there's no God up there. It's that simple. I understand atheist position perfectly. If there's any God up there, then this thing down here don't make any sense. Unless there's something on ahead. Now that's where they blow it, you see. But how do you explain this and that about God letting this? You know what atheist thinks? He, he, the first book in the Bible is written for an atheist. It's Job, not Genesis. Job is written 800 years before Genesis is written. And the theme of that book is why do the righteous suffer? And God pulls back the scenery there and shows you what goes on behind the scenery the scientists can't find. And the problem comes up, if God is good, why does he let this stuff take place? And a fellow says, because he's powerless to stop it. You say, yeah, but God's all-powerful. If he's all-powerful, he couldn't be all good. Because he's all-powerful, doesn't stop it, then he isn't any good. That's how they figure. They could God stop the war? Could God stop this baby from dying? Could God stop this fellow from coming back overseas a basket case? Could God stop this kid from being flayed alive over there in Vietnam in a rice paddy? Yeah. Well, if he's good, why didn't he stop it? That's how they figure. You know what they don't figure on? 
retribution. Someday it get level. Someday she comes out even. Bob Jones Sr. used to say this. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, war is God's judgment on the sin here, and hell is God's judgment on the sin hereafter. That's one of the most profound statements a man ever made. War is God's judgment on sin here, and hell is God's judgment on sin hereafter. The fact that God lets stuff happen the way it happens here, you know what that shows? That shows there's something worse on the other side. Something worse. Some of you say, well, God wouldn't let it. Yes, he will. He does. He does. War is God's judgment on sin here, and hell is God's judgment on sin hereafter. So we talk about these things, we're talking about a time that God's going to make an equitable adjustment and, and, and weigh the balances. You ever stop and think about this? Not every good thing you ever you did for people ever gets rewarded in this life. It isn't just the bad things. A fellow said you commit a perfect murder? Sure you can, man. Many a murder killed somebody never got found out. I, I've talked to hit men over telephone at night, drunk, trying to get saved, hit men phone up, where well, the guy has killed two dozen people. Some of those Pip fellows like Barbarossa, the ape, and worked there for, you know, the, with New England Mafia and that bunch. They killed 70, 80 guys. They never caught them. Those fellows got up in years before somebody finally blew their brains out. But they didn't catch him for the murders. You get away with murder, you get away with murder. Down here. But not up there. Someday the skeleton will come out, boy. Sometimes your victim will step out of the grave and say, He did it! Boy, wait till you see that Kennedy mask when the thing comes to like. Wait till you see that one, boy. And I find out where Jimmy Hoffa is, you know. <laughs> I've got a book by a hit man that uh, I don't want to give him any publicity. I guess they want to pretend like it's still a mystery. But with him, Jimmy Hoffa is no mystery. He's, he tells the very part of the stadium in New York he's buried in, where he got poured in the cement. He shot him. Shot him a 22 caliber pistol and they cut up his body, body with a with a meat saw and put him in black plastic bag. He described the whole cotton picking thing. But you know, someday all that stuff's going to come out. And when it comes out, my what day that's going to be. My my day that's going to be. Why listen, there are people in this world that have done right and suffered for it. They've never been rewarded. There are people in this life that have done unselfish things for people and kind things for people and sacrifice for people. They never got nothing out of it but an unkind word or an insult or a cussing. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. How about, how about Stephen? He didn't deserve it. All he got was a bunch of rocks in the brains, for, rocks in the head for trying to tell him the truth. He was out there getting people healed. Got his brains rocked out. Listen, if there's any God up there, now, no doubt in my mind, I've got any doubts. If any got up there, then someday he's got to square the account. And he's going to square it. Or well, he intercepts a fellow like this, and let's bring him in, let's open the books and see how he made out. You know, we at our church, we sing a song once in a while that says, uh, the old account was large and growing every day. You ever sing that song, you know? Well, I was always sinning and never tried to pay, but when I looked ahead and saw the pain of old, I said that I was settled and settled long ago. An old account I was standing. You know, sin yet unforgiven. My name was at the top and many things below. I went up to the keeper and settled it long ago. Have you settled it? I settled it the 14th of March, 1949. Monday morning, about 10 o'clock in the morning. Settled it. And until, it, listen, until things are settled with God, nothing is settled. American stupid people, they think you can settle stuff in court, or settle stuff with a lawyer, or settle stuff with a doctor, or settle stuff with a peace conference or something. Listen, until a thing is settled with God, it isn't settled. Some of you have to go back to the same thing over and over again. You're just fighting the thing every week, over and over, over and over, over. It isn't settled. You know why it's not settled? It hasn't been settled with God. And it didn't settle right to settle with God, till it settle with God, it's going to keep you messed up for weeks, days, months, and years. So on 15, 20, 25, get it settled with God. It'll be settled. Well, let's bring him in here. Let's open the books and see how he made out. Uh, you know, when I went to Bob Jones, I had a professor named Brokenshire. He had a PhD from Edinburgh and Heidelberg and some other burgs. And he uh, could speak, read, and write eight different languages. And he said to me in class one day, he said, Mr. Ruckman, he said, we do not have to necessarily believe that God has literal books. 
And I said, we don't have to necessarily be redundant either, do we? <laughs> you better look out for these professors that always say, we don't have to necessarily believe. <laughs> you don't have to necessarily not believe either, man. I mean, if you can take my voice, put the thing, this thing right here, put a tape back there, put a camera, and put my, those, that video and put that thing on a TV station, shoot that thing out through a bunch of wires and pitch that thing out 50 miles across the place and a fella put it back in his living room and hear me and see me two years after I'm dead, you'd think God have some sense, wouldn't you? Don't you got the little computer system worked up? Folks always about, about how great man is. Why, if this stupid, silly man who's got something so small, it's about to blow him the kingdom come, and he can't handle it, if he made a little computer chip that big that can, 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 can take care of 20 million facts, what do you think God got rigged up? Do you think 3 billion people have any problem for God? With 150 million thoughts a day? Flip, 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 like that. Sometime I think of the judgment seat of Christ, you just lie all, light up all the Christians, just look at them. <laughs> when he looks at them, his eyes are as a flame of fire. When he looks at them, all them works just burn. Maybe you feel the flame, I don't know. I don't believe in purgatory, but boy, Paul says, knowing the terror of the Lord, you're going you're gonna to get something. Why don't you take this thing right here, you bring this fellow in here and try him out, and the books are open. The Rubaiyat of Omer Khayyam says, The moving hand, having writ, moves on, nor all thy piety nor all thy wit shall draw it back to cancel half a line of it. Pilate says, What I have written, I have written. And he wrote something out there about this is uh, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And those old Pharisees didn't like that. And they said, Right down there, just that he said, I'm King of the Jews. You know what Pilate said? Pilate said, What I have written, I have written. Now, my Lord is writing, my Lord is writing, my Lord is writing all the time, my Lord is writing, my Lord is writing, my Lord is writing all the time. Since I got up this morning, I've been writing a record. Since you got up this morning, you've been writing a record. What kind of record is it? How about it since you got out of bed this morning up till right now? What kind of a record is it? That's the stuff. Open the books and see how the fellow made out. And, uh, well, take, take a look at a soul really as, as the Lord sees it. All right, first of all, this fellow, is a, he's a murderer. I never killed anybody. I never even went to war. I never shot anybody. What do you mean I'm a murderer? You can't hang that rap on me. I'm not a murderer. I never killed anybody. What makes you have to think, what makes you think you've got to kill somebody to be a murderer? You know American, the most superstitious pagan people in the world. Why would you think that? The Bible says, whoever hates his brother in his heart is a murderer, and you know no murderer hath eternal life abiding in it. O.J. Simpson, not a murderer because he killed his wife or ex-wife or whatever it was, and the ex, whatever it was. That white guy don't get much publicity, does he? <laughs> you take, he's not a murderer because he killed those folks. If he killed those folks, he killed them because he was a murderer. A man is not a thief because he steals. He steals because he's a thief. You understand? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You think about it before you do it. Bob Jones Sr. had something to say about that, too. I know I call him a good bit, but I call him a good bit because I think he had a great deal of wisdom. And old man Bob used to say this. He used to say, at the back of every tragedy and character, there's a long process of wicked thinking. That's got it. That's got it. I know the truth when I hear it. I know it when I hear it. At the back of every tragedy and character, there's a long process of wicked thinking. When a young girl gets in bad trouble at church, you know, the best girl you got in your youth department, you know, she winds up, you know, with a baby and no husband, and people wonder what, how in the world it happened, you know, say, well, how, I just wouldn't have thought that of her. I just can't understand that. It just happened overnight, all of a sudden. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. Nothing happens overnight. Nothing happens all of a sudden. You got to think about it. You gotta sit there and work on it. And pretty soon the thought becomes an action. The action becomes a, a habit. The habit forms your character. And pretty soon you're shot. Oh. By thy word thou shalt be justified, by thy word thou shalt be condemned. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of man's heart his mouth speaks. Now I might look across this congregation tonight, it's that set fellow back there. He's a good looking kid and got a 
shave, you know, and clean cut and carrying his Bible with him. That fellow must be a Christian. God might look out across this congregation tonight and say, is that fellow back there? He's a killer, got a switchblade in his pocket, ready to do business. He knows what you're thinking. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. The biggest joke the devil ever pulled in this country was when he taught young people that God didn't know what they were doing. That's the biggest thing. You want what's wrong with the whole public school system from grade school to college. If those kids are not taught that God doesn't see every place they put their hand. You never put your hand any place God didn't see where you put it. They think because the music's loud and the, and the smoke is thick and the, and the lights are low, God doesn't see. Uh, that comes from not reading the Bible in school. That comes from, from uh, trying to make a separation between church and state and run God out of the educational system. Now they give them the Bible and they get the, the penitentiary. That's really using your head, isn't it? You know, keep the, keep the Bible and the Kibbles in school and they winds up in the pen, give them a Bible. Well, what, a, what a thing, man, what a thing. You know, what, you know what, what, what a head of a penitentiary told me here about three months ago? He said, the Ruckman, he said, you know what trouble is? I said, well, he said, we've got a new breed of criminals we can't control. I said, well, he said, you can't make them do anything. And I said, why not? He said, they're not afraid. I said, why not afraid? He said, uh, they've never experienced pain and they know you can't hurt them. You know what, you know what a fellow fears? You know what a fellow fears? Pain. You know what you don't like? Physical pain. You know, back all the time. Can't sleep more than an hour at a time. Hurts you. Twist on the side, lie on that side, lie on this side, take the pain pills. But listen, you've taken the pain pills so much, you're about to become a, a dope addict, and you try to get off the pain pill, then you can't sleep. Cancer eating away. Taking pills, cut down the pain. Folks, pain, pain. Listen, a baby that's never been spanked, and a young man or woman that's never been slapped, and a teenager's never been kicked in the tail end, and a soldier's never had his, been smacked in the gut of the face, in worth 15 cents. Yes, amen, 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 amen. <laughs> I mean, folks, I don't agree with you. It won't be the first time you've been wrong or the last time. <laughs> I'm mean, yourself, so, you see, I know what you're thinking. Oh, that Ruckman, just so rough and, no, 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 man, no, man, uh, no. I'm just, I just know men. I know men. I've had to handle men all my life. Six sons and four daughters, most of my life have been with fellows 15 to 25 years old. In the army before I was saved, in the ministry after I, I know men, I know myself. I know when I, I know when I, when I, when I, if I, if I, I'm glad I wasn't six feet tall. If I was six feet tall with the temperament I had, I'd have been dead by now. I'd have gotten all kinds of trouble. But I was just small enough so I had an element of caution in my makeup. <laughs> when it got real bad, you see. You say, why? Oh, because I got the tongue knocked out of me a couple of times. I learned how to be careful. <laughs> it's good for you to learn to be careful. <laughs> while you take a talk about beatings, why they don't hurt a kid. They don't hurt a kid. That child abuse, child abuse. I, I, I'm sure it happens sometimes. Well, they're trying to make the whole nation match this crap you see in Hollywood and television and stuff. Looks like all you middle class white people trying to make you think you're, you're, you're all like that bunch out there that are there. Those are feature stories. Those are the exception. That's to get you to watch the thing. That has nothing to do with American people. I don't know. I, ch child abuse. I know some real rough cases of child abuse. About eight of them. I know about two of them personally. Well, what's that? That's uh, 73 years down here. There must not be a lot of it going on. All this stuff. Why, child abuse, man. If, if, if they'd been around, I was coming up. My, my daddy'd been locked up every other week. <laughs> I mean, he beat you, boy, to your pants stuck to you. And my principal, I was in the principal's office so much, they should have made me vice principal. <laughs> I mean, that bird had a paddle that wide and that thick and that long. And he beat you to your britches stuck to you, man. And you walked home like this. <laughs> you didn't go down to the HRS, see what they did to me. <laughs> I got my bruise, bruise your foot, boy, blood, boy. I'm in the woodshed, blood was shed. <laughs> and when you got home, you couldn't tell your daddy about it, or he'd smack you again. Come over, daddy, I'd walk up the steps like this. And I'd get up in my room, and I'd walk like this again. <laughs> you say, you poor boy, oh, cut it out, cut it out, cut it out, man. 
Listen, they only caught me about a third of the time. <laughs> I thank God I figured I got off light, boy. I get thinking about these things. You know what I think? I think my generation must just been more honest than your generation. It must be. We just must have been straight in your generation. We had stuff like that coming to us. We knew we had it coming. I didn't like it. Sure, I yelled, I complained, uh, you know, hollered and screamed, but I never thought I didn't have it coming. Not once. Not once. You never heard me say, I don't deserve that. <laughs> Not me, boy. I knew they owed me some more I didn't even get. <laughs> like a boy one time, he was about, he was about, about 14 years old. And back when I was a boy, and you had tricks or treats at Halloween, you know, you really did tricks on them, you know. I'm mean, you dumped over the stuff and turning the hose in the window, that kind of stuff, and you don't know, put toothpicks in the car and left the horn blowing. I don't think I didn't give you treats, you gave them tricks. <laughs> we had, uh, out there, and we had a, a fellow out there, he had a stable, he had a big, had a big white horse on top of that stable. God, Godfrey, the fellow's name was Godfrey's uh, horse stables. And every Halloween we'd paint that thing black stripes and that thing like a zebra. <laughs> and the big thing on I was boy was dump over outhouses. That was a pushover out hours, you know. And one boy, his daddy finally got him out for Halloween. The kid's about 15 years old, and, the, and he said, Now, you tell me the truth about it. You know who did this? And the boy said, Well, I'm going to be like George Washington. Daddy, I cannot tell a lie. He said, I'm my gang dumped over that outhouse. The old man got a belt and blistered him good. And he got through, the boy was crying and said, What'd you do that for? I told you the truth. He said, You did. I, I thought, he said, George Washington, he said, I cut down the cherry tree with my hatchet, and his daddy didn't whip him. And the old man said, listen, George Washington's daddy wasn't up in that cherry tree when he cut it down. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, man. All right, the guy's wanted for murder. He wanted for murder. That isn't all. Adultery. Oh, you can't get me for that. I never came here. Don't I ever step out my wife? What do, you, what do you mean? I never step out my wife. I've only been married one time. You can't accuse me of adultery. You know, America was stupid. I had a fellow down in Birmingham one time. I had a meeting for him down there, and I came down there, and about the time I came to town, a professor from, from, from Mid South phoned up in Memphis. Professors seem to have a strange uh, 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 relationship to me. College professors. They, they have a strange kind of relationship to me. And, and he phoned this fellow up and he said, I hear you're having Ruckman in for a meeting. And he said, yeah, I'm having him in for a meeting. So I'm sorry to hear that. He said, well, he always gives us a good meeting. You know, people get saved, we're glad to have him in. And he said, I didn't think you had adulterers in your pulpit. He said, oh, sure, we have them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy said, you do? And the guy said, yes, as a matter of fact, I'm an adulterer myself. <laughs> and he said, well, I didn't know that. I think, yeah, I thought she'd only been married once. And he said, well, I have been, you know, but the Bible says whoever looks upon a woman the lust after in his heart hath already come. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. Right. Little trouble there, Caiaphas? <laughs> Having trouble with your Bible doctrine, are you, Caiaphas? I think so. I've got a picture at home. It's always been funny. It's a Pharisee crossing the street. Some guy back in 1890 painted this thing. It's a beauty. And he's crossing the street. And he got his phylacteries on his head, you know, his, his robes on. And there's a good-looking woman crossing the street this side, and he's, he's smacking right into a building looking that way. He's going across like this and going like this. <laughs> I think that's the trouble some of the brethren have. <laughs> all right, that isn't all. That isn't all. He's the thief. I never did steal. I never robbed a bank. I never robbed a 7-Eleven. I, I never carnapped anybody, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, what makes you think you have to do that to be a thief? I mean, Americans are pagan, stupid, spiritual. They have no spiritual discernment. I mean, did you ever, did you ever get paid for a 40 hour week and you only work 30 hours? <laughs> you stole 10 hours pay. See? See what I mean, Jelly Bean? I mean, folks, they have this funny way of thinking, well, you got to rob a gas station or a cash register. No, you don't. I mean, how you fellows sitting here tonight? Any of you fellows ever steal a bloom of purity off a young girl's cheeks? How about some young people sitting here tonight? Did you ever steal 10 years off your mom and daddy's life living like you did? Nah. Now, the truth is, matter, some of you are so crooked, if you fell through a barrel of fish hooks, you wouldn't get stuck one time going down. 
you got to screw your socks on in the morning. I mean, I mean, tell the truth about it. Haven't you got some books in your library that don't belong to you? Ah. Uh -huh. Well, Ruckman, I just barred about how I've been a good while at it. Been a good while at it. I think so. You know, down south, when I want to find out how many crooks we got in the building down there, I make them all stand up. And then I say, if none of you have ever stolen a watermelon, sit down. And boy, I tell you, you pull that thing off down south, the congregation of 400, you won't get more than 10 people sitting down. <laughs> and I was down in Alabama one time, did that, said, if you never stole a watermelon, sit down. And the congregation, about 200 people and three or four of them sat down. And there's one gray-haired lady back there in the back, about 60 years old, and she just turned beet red in the face, and she'd kind of start to sit down, and she'd stand back up again, and she'd scoot down again, and she'd start standing up again. <laughs> And the service all over, I stopped her, I said, Sister, you having a little trouble there? And she said, well, Brother Ruffman, she said, when I was a little girl, she said, we used to do that, but we didn't call it stealing, we just called it taking them. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, taking them, I know, taking them. I like those two fellows in prison, one of them studying, you know, and the other fellow's getting on him for study, and he said, you make fun of me all you want if we get out of here. He said, I'm going to be an embezzler and you'll still just be a thief. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if all you can do is rob a, a cash register of a station or break into a bank, you've got problems, man. But if you can rob, uh, you, if you can rob the state, state highway department of 40,000 bucks, they'll make you a city commissioner. <laughs> just depending on how you look at it. <laughs> well, you know how stuff is? It's a thief. It's a thief. It's a thief. Folks don't realize they're going to be judged by a standard of perfection. I'm not going to judge you. You're going to be judged by a perfect man. No mistakes. No mistakes. Oh, and, 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 and he's a liar. You say, can God save a liar? Yeah, he can save a liar. It's pretty hard, though. <laughs> the liar gets saved. He can't believe he is saved, and he does get saved, because he's been lying for so long. He thinks God's lying. That's where people have that kind of trouble. But you take that kind of thing, back in the old days, you called a fellow a liar, you had a fight in your hands. You don't anymore. I've called hundreds of fellow liars to their face and in the paper and the bullet, everything else. They don't do anything. They whine, fuss, or laugh at it. They don't have any convictions anymore. They know they're lying. I had to meet one time with a pastor down in Atapogos, Georgia, during a big liquor fight down there, and the city council had gotten rid of the liquor, and the mayor had got it voted back in and changed the books and messed up a bunch of stuff. This preacher down, I was preaching for down there, was just furious about it. One day we're driving downtown, and the mayor happened to be walking on the sidewalk there. This Baptist preacher I was preaching with, got out of the car, walked right by the fellow on that street, put his finger right in front of his face, and said, You're nothing but a dirty, low down, lying crook. <laughs> well, I mean, people all the street heard it. And that fellow said, laughed, said, Well, you know, that's just politics. It's just politics. That's all they did with it. We raised a whole nation large, just lie like a dog. I call them liars, you know, this bunch here, Bob Jones, Tennessee Temple, you know, Donna Waite and that bunch, I call them liars. They're not going to do anything about it. They wouldn't dare do anything about it. I got the goods on them, they know it. Or they just get mad. I don't like Ruckman's speech. I don't like his attitude. Tough apple, Sonny. We're going to keep right on doing it. I mean, Donna Waite says, well, I believe the King James Bible is the word of God, but I don't believe in correcting the Greek uh, with the English like Ruckman does. Sure he does. You bet your life it is. You don't know if a fellow in this country doesn't correct that Greek with that, with that English if he's a fundamentalist. That Greek, every Greek manuscript they've got, Matthew chapter 28, says Sabbath, plural, plural. I never heard a fundamentalist in my life call that Sabbath, plural. He called it singular, King James. You know, think kingdom of heaven in your Bible? That isn't kingdom of heaven at all. It's uranos. It's uranon, uh, of, plural, genitive, plural, masculine, of the heavens. It's a plural. They all correct the book with English. And say Ruckman's a heretic for saying you correct the book with English. They do it themselves. You take an Acts chapter 7, Stephen called upon God and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. There's any God in any Greek manuscript. There's none in the majority text. There's none in the text. There isn't any Greek manuscript of any set of manuscripts. And they all correct it. And then Ruckman tells the truth about it, and then they say, well, Ruckman's a fanatic, Ruckman's a cult, Ruckman a heretic. You're a bald-faced liar, and I can prove it in court. You want to start tonight? That's what upsets those fellows. Upsets them so bad. I mean, they get more nervous than a clam at low tide. Boy, they have a time of it, man, that kind of stuff. 
And they always give you a run around. The trouble with Ruckman is this. The trouble with Ruckman is that. No, that ain't the trouble. That ain't the trouble. The trouble with Ruckman is stand right here and call them liars and hypocrites and apostates and there's nothing they can do about it. I've been doing it for 43 years. 45 years now. And I'm going to keep right on doing it, Lord willing, right up to the end. And don't be any good my blame, blow my brains out. Even I'm on tape now, I'll just play the tapes after I'm dead. <laughs> Martin Luther said about the Catholics, this abominable crowd, he said, if they take my body and burn it and throw my ashes in the Tiber River, I'll come back to harass them. <laughs> I can do it, but tape. Art is a liar. Now, I'm not going to write down the rest of them. Big sins, little sins, white sins, chartreuse sins, organdy sins. You know, back in the old days, sin was sin. But now it's all kind of, it's got kind of a gray area. Back in the old days, hell was hot, and eternity was long, and the sin was scarlet, and it was black. Now it's all kind of a mushy kind of a gray. Billy Graham says, I don't believe that hell is actually a fire. I think it's just separation from God, Billy says. So that the press about a month ago. Why, listen, Billy, every unsaved man in Detroit is separated from God right now. Why would you think hell was just like right now? Why, every unsaved man is alone in the world without hope and without God. What a thing, man, what a thing. And you see, they, 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 it's a buzzword, what they call doublespeak. You live, in the, uh, you're, you're, you're live in the age of the great con man's pitch. What we used to call uh, pitches for pipe men at the flat joints in the fair where they uh, tap a mark. We had, a, we, had a, we had our own expression for saying things. And what we were saying was you get a sucker and you con him, you, 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 you pitch him, you give him a pitch, see? And then you con him out of something. That's the day and age you're living in. They don't talk plain. Now, you know me. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm crude. I've got no coof. I tell them I'm very class conscious. I've got no class, and people are very conscious of it. <laughs> and, it and, and through the years, I get probably a little bit worse. But uh, there's something about professionalism I never could tolerate. I don't tolerate it now. I'm not a professional. I'm not a professional. I, I think professionalism stinks. Uh, you, you take, I'm a PhD. You know what that is? That's a post hole digger. <laughs> uh, a PhD is a doctor of philosophy. I teach the stuff. I hold three earned degrees or education degrees. None of them are religious degrees, they're education degrees. You have never seen me with my own kind. See me with Bartlett's, but they're hockey players and blood ball players and pastors. A PhD sitting around discussing, you know, the stuff PhDs discuss. You never seen my crowd. My crowd are mullet fishermen. And gardeners, I grow a garden. I walk around with bare feet. I never wear shoes unless I have to. Never. I think shoes are the devil. <laughs> <laughs> I got three German shepherds. Three German shepherds. You talk about intimidating, boy, when you hear that bunch at night. We got one of them's a female and two of them are males. The male pup's the big one now. And boy, when that bird goes off at night, you hear that thing go, roo, 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 roo. Be you second thoughts about whatever you're going to do. <laughs> That's my crowd, the fishermen, the uh, construction men, you know, farmers, laborers, and woodsmen, that kind of thing. You never see me with PhDs. You never want to see me with them either. Lord willing, you never want to see me with them. It's the professionals. Oh. Uh, Dr. Ruckman, don't you believe that here where the eod of subscriptum has been used in this epsilon contract word, that perhaps in the contraction of the vowel, the anti-penal should receive the uh, help, yeah, you know. I mean, I mean, that's my bunch, boy, that's my bunch. You want me to see that bunch? You know what, I, I can't stand that pull on. I'm plain, I'm plain, I'm plain. But I, I folks fool, they think I'm something complicated. There's nothing complicated about Ruckman. The reason I fool so many folks is I'm just so plain. I think that ice cream is vanilla. That's right. So what about the other, any other kind of ice cream? Only kind of ice cream, vanilla. You should like that. I didn't say I like it. That's, ice cream is vanilla. Now the rest, you know, chocolate, pecan, you like it, okay, that's frozen dessert, you know. 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. But ice cream is vanilla. That's what it is. And nothing else is ice cream. Sherbert, Sherbert. That isn't ice cream. That's Sherbert. <laughs> you know what I think candy is? It's chocolate. Chocolate is candy. That's the only kind of candy it is. Chocolate. Just plain chocolate. Say chocolate nut? No nuts. Just chocolate. That's candy. I like baked potatoes with butter and salt. See? Not fricassee, scallop, mayonnaise, all that junk. Put on. Just bake the potato, put the butter, and eat the whole potato. <laughs> That's right, the skin, the whole cotton-picking thing, see? I'm a plain fella. I can't stand this. I, I pick up a, an ad in the paper, and here's a car about that long. Take you 35 cents to park a thing. About the color of a rotten Easter egg, and it says, more than an automobile, a new concept in automotive experience. Ah, shut up. <laughs> a new, it's a rolling piece of junk. Everything you buy down there is a rolling piece of junk. You can have a brand new rolling piece of junk. <laughs> and park that thing out there, and the first thing you know, the clock doesn't work. <laughs> and the heater doesn't work. And then their top light doesn't work. And then the radio doesn't work, and then the solenoid, and then the generator, and then the battery, and then the brake line. It's a rolling piece of junk. And this stuff, a new concept, an automotive, oh, your father's mustache, man. That stuff, that stuff is just, that's news media stuff. That's how they, that's the, that's the pitch of the pipe man, the tap the sucker, boy. I mean, they say, well, it's adult consent. It's adultery. You say it's premarital sex. You mean fornication? We have so much trouble with your language. You say it's drug abuse, you dopehead. <laughs> see, my generation was clear, see. And I don't say they were right, but they were plain. Do you take those fellows back in the army I was in? They had some expressions, and I couldn't repeat them. <laughs> but believe me, when they said something, you knew what they said. <laughs> we had an expression when a fellow kept saying, we this, and we that, and we did, we this. A fellow would say, what do you mean, we? Have you got a... And then he had something mean I couldn't repeat it, but but it was very vivid, believe me. <laughs> and they'd say, when a guy get up got in the morning, it, when he'd been an overnight drunk, they said his eyes looked like two, and they had an expression there, which I couldn't repeat. We knew what to call the queers. We had a word for them. It was a compound word. <laughs> it was two words, believe me. All this stuff, gay, gay. <laughs> You mean queer, fruit, faggot, <laughs> double-breasted fink, fairy, you know, Frisco faggot, fairy fruity, that's what you mean, fruity fruity. You mean, yeah, man, yes, we Folks say, so Ruckman, how unkind of you. No, how stupid of you to brag about your sins. I mean, I think a queer can be saved, but if he's saved, he isn't going to brag about his sins. Whoever of a Christian carrying a sign, gay pride, proud of it. I never met a Christian in my life who was proud of his sins. I've seen some of them who talked about them. They, did, they weren't proud of them. I've known Christian be sorry for the sins. I've known Christian who couldn't quit sin. I've known Christian who had a terrible battle with sin. I never met one that bragged about it. Proud, gape, is that so? Is that so? Now, I'm not saying you can't be saved, but boy, don't tell me you're saved if, you, if you're proud of your sins. And I get so tired of it, you know. I get so tired of it. I like classical music. Well, the best thing my kids ever did for me, and my, my kids at my, my school, the fellows I teach them in school, I call them my kids. Of course, I can do that now, you know. I mean, most of them are about as old as my grandchildren. And my kid, they always give me something in the year. One time they gave me a, a, a Derringer, which I appreciated. <laughs> and one time they bought me, one time they bought me a, 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 a thing of the Rick, uh, Rick, uh, uh, what's his name, the uh, Heinz uh, Hockey School, the pro hockey school in Chicago, a couple of summers ago. Appreciate that. I didn't go back. They gave me an invitation this year to come back. I didn't go. One time trip there is enough, brother. That's for young men. That's for young men. <laughs> and then one time they gave me a hundred CDs of classical music. Boy, I appreciated that. Because I don't have to listen to the FM station anymore. The only thing I hate to hear, it's, I'm right in the middle of joy and Schumann or Brahms or Beethoven or Tchaikovsky or Rachmaninoff or somebody, and I hear this voice come on and say, 
And now we're going to hear Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 5. <laughs> that wasn't Ludwig. <laughs> that wasn't Ludwig, you know. Well, down there, there's WWF, Pensacola, Florida. Florida. <laughs> It's a, it's a closed shop down there. That FM station down there has had six radio announcers in 10 years, and every one of them just as queer as a $3 bill. It, it, it's the language. They always dress it up, you see. Street people. You mean bums? <laughs> oh, no, brother, up in there, transits. Yeah, transits. You mean bums? You know, you, you know, you know, you know we used to call people like Mick Jaggers and that bunch, we call them slobs. They got the long hair like that, you know. Pick it, he's a slob. <laughs> and Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't a slob. I don't know what that thing is there, but that's a that's a mystery program. You don't you don't know what that thing is, man. I mean it ain't male, it ain't female, it ain't black, and it ain't white. It ain't a man, it ain't a woman, it ain't a kid, it ain't an old man. I don't know what it is. It, yeah. I think anybody will believe in aliens from outer space if they looked at that. <laughs> I mean, all those couldn't be ours. <laughs> but they have these names, you see. Except fellows, he's a chronic alcoholic. He's a drunk. He's a drunkard. She's a chronic alcoholic. She's a bimbo, boy. She's a bimbo and he's a lush. Don't kid me, I know the terms for him. All that stuff is, all that stuff is, it's, it's veneer. It's, uh, it's shellac. It's to make you think the person you're talking to is is caring and sensitive. Those are sheep, those are wolves in sheep's clothing, and the saliva's dripping off their jaws, boy. They're killers. They're killers. I know them. All this stuff. I go into a place, I like some shoe polish. You can't find a shoe polish in the cut picking store. It's shoe refinisher, shoe refiner, backs remover, so and so shiner, so and so luster, shoe polish. Shoe polish, got any shoe polish? Tell them I want some toilet paper. So, toilet paper? Well, we got this tissue and this tissue. Toilet paper. You know what toilet paper is? <laughs> it's the age. I hate it. I hate it. I just despise it. You have a funeral. The body's down at the funeral home. Now, I'm not going to put the funeral homes out of business. I know that. And I've had to preach funerals, and I, and I don't like to preach them, but I don't like to preach them. There's too much professionalism. I don't like it. The funeral home. That ain't my home. Don't you call that my home? You call that rest law, you know, memorial gardens. It's a graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> that thing down there is a morgue, and that thing's a graveyard. I don't know what the thing is right there. All that stuff, and they, this beautiful casket all fixed up with the pillow and the satin and all this stuff. I don't like that. You say, why? Death is not like that. All these pretty flowers around, what are they there for? Well, a corpse smells pretty bad after four or five days. Nothing pretty about death. Nothing pretty about a little casket there about that long. You know, mom and daddy crying over a little white casket. You can't make that thing pretty. It's, it's, it's this constant attempt to make the thing nice and sweet and kind. It's feminine. And I ain't no woman. The whole thing is feminine. She's got this, may I help you? What would you like? Have a nice day. Shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to sleep in the plane. Can I get you anything? No, thank you. Wouldn't you like a magazine? No, thank you. Can I get you something neat? No, thank you. Aren't you going to take, get the out of here, lady. <laughs> I'll get that back to this in a minute. But you know, that, you know what they're trying to do? They're trying to be nice. And to me, it stinks. May I show you a seat? No, get out of my way. I find my own seat. I don't. I went to eat with Brother Barta today, and I got in ahead of him, so I went right and sat down. Now, if I'd been with him, I'd have had to wait to be seated, you know. But when I go in a place, I don't wait ever to be seated. Never. I'm paying the bill. They're there to wait on me. Amen? How do you Americans? You think you're there to wait on them? And then they give you the shaft when they give you the check? I'm paying them, man. I'm paying them. I get so tired and worn out with that stuff. It's, all, it's, 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 a, it's a 
Uh, if, if, if it's feminine, it's, if this nice wife treating everybody like they're this little helpless person that needs all this attention. I don't need the attention. And don't want the attention. I come in a storm, may I show you something? No, thank you, just looking around. Anything special? No. <laughs> just looking around. Well, if I can show you that, just get out, I'll go to another store. <laughs> My wife tries to help me, you know, she tries to civilize me, but I have a hard time with it. I'll say to my wife, I said, well, what am I telling him? I step in the plane and the stewardess says, I like your hat. Well, it's none of her business what kind of hat I wear. <laughs> I mean, I like your tie. You want to buy it? <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, I, and, and she said, well, honey, they just kind of compliment you. They're just compliment. I said, I don't appreciate the compliment. I'm sticking nose in my business. I said, what am I supposed to say? He said, you're supposed to say thank you. See? Thank you for what? <laughs> <laughs> now, I know you're not that bad, see? And I know that's maybe a bad example, except for the younger folks. But that's the way I am. I came up where it was plain, and it was, it was rough, and open, and crude, and rude, and uncouth, and plain, and real. And I didn't lose my manhood when I got saved. I still like it real. I don't care how bad it is. Just so it's real. This unreal stuff. All this stuff. You bury me. Don't you bury me in one of those silk things with the pillars. Boy, you bury me in a pine box, man, if I die before the Lord comes. You bury me in a pine box and leave one end loose so I get out in a hurry when the Lord comes back. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there they are, big sins, chartreuse sins, uh, all kinds of sin, but sin is sin, and he's a sinner. Points his finger at him and says, Depart from you, curse the devil, lasting fire, prepare the devil and his angels. So how can God send a man out to hell to burn forever for a few little things like that? Well, he won't. If you ever go to hell, you'll have to do something worse than that. God can save a murderer. He saved Moses. God can save an adulterer, he saved David. God can save a thief, he saved the, the dying thief. God can even save a liar, like I said, but it's kind of difficult because he can't get any assurance when he doesn't get saved. <laughs> but he can get saved too. There's only one kind of man God can't save. You see, the sin that damns a man is the sins of omission. And what this fellow did, this fellow looked right in the face of God's son dying on the cross for his sins, and said, well, when I get so I can live it, I'll be around. Are you sitting right there? If you ever go to hell, it won't be for something you did. It'll be for something you didn't do. Look here. A fellow doesn't die because he's sick. He dies because he don't get well, right? That's profound. As long as he's sick, he's alive, ain't he? <laughs> All right, the fellow's sick, and I come up, and I say, you sick? Yeah, I'm sick. I'm dying. I say, take that pill, and you get well. He says, I don't want it. I said, try it. Well, I said, I don't take it. I say, just try the thing. I've seen it work a thousand times. He said, I don't believe in it. I said, you don't have to believe in it. Just try it. He said, I don't feel like it. I say, you feel like you're dying, don't you? Yeah, open. Take it. And the guy says, I really believe it'll work. I say, good. Swallow. <laughs> He says, I think as soon as I take that, it'll make me well. I say, good, swallow. He says, no, I'm not going to take it. I say, why not? He says, well, I, I just can't live it. I say, you're dying, man. Whether you're living or not, try it. There are too many hypocrites in the church. <laughs> what you going to do with a fellow like that? He's going to die. You go to hell for what you don't do. You know what that thing might have is right there? That's much worse than this. This is DSI. If Christ was God manifest in the flesh, if he was, you're guilty of deicide. Not homicide, patricide, deicide. Grand larceny. you stolen something that wasn't yours. What? Your life. God gave you your life. Grand larceny. High treason. If he's the sovereign of the universe, that's high treason. Not just against the king, the king of kings. You really did it good. If you're in here. Now, someday I'm going to see all you folks again. You say, where? Up here? Someday every one of you people in this building is going to be up here. You're going to be down here. You say, where are you going to be, Ruckman? I'm going to be up here. You say, well, aren't you guilty of these things? Yes. 
You say, shouldn't you be down there? Yes. But you're not going to be? No. You say, why not? I took the cure. Amen. I took the cure. Amen. Christ said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. Amen. You don't come into condemnation. Daniel chapter 7, thousand, thousand ministered to him, and thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. There are two classes. One bunch being judged by Christ, another bunch being judged with Christ. Didn't you ever read your Bible? 1 Corinthians, what? Know ye not that ye shall judge angels? What? Know ye not the saints shall judge the world? You're going to judge with Christ. They're judging you now. Right now they're looking at you, and if you live for God, they call you a fanatic, and if you don't live for God, they call you a hypocrite. They're judging you now, but someday you're going to judge them. Amen. Now I'm going to see every one of you again someday. Where are you going to be? You're going to be down here, or you're going to be up there. I dream that the great judgment morning had dawned and the trumpet had blown. I dream that the unsaved were gathered for judgment before the white throne. From the throne stepped a bright shining angel and stood on the land and the sea. And he swore with his hand raised to heaven that time was no longer to be. And oh, what a weeping and wailing, as the lost were told of their fate. They cried for the rocks and the mountains. They prayed, but their prayer was too late. The moral man came to the judgment but his self-righteous rags would not do. The men who had crucified Jesus had passed off as moral men too. The soul that neglected salvation, not tonight, I'll get saved by and by. Oh, no time now to think of salvation, for at last, they had found time to die. And oh, what a weeping and wailing, as the lost were told of their fate. They cried for the rocks and the mountains. They prayed, but their prayer was too late. Now, don't you let it be too late for you. The old book says, now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer.